Hi, everybody. My name is Neil Thompson, founder of Teach the Geek. It's an online platform for science and engineering professionals. The first offering is a public speaking course, and it's called Teach the Geek to Speak. To learn more about it, you can go to teachthegeek.com. Again, that is teachthegeek.com. I was recently, just yesterday, called an inspiration. And while I thought it was a really nice compliment, after reading Stephanie Espy's bio, it looks like I still got a little ways to go. <laughs> She started a company called Math SP, and it's a prep service for math and science subjects. But what really impressed me about what she's doing is STEM Gems, and it's a book whose mission is to inspire girls to consider STEM careers. The book features 44 women working in different STEM fields and tips on how, those, on how girls can pursue those fields. Thanks for, for, for coming to the, to the channel, Stephanie. Thank you for having me today. Oh, thanks. Thank you. So I, I know from just from reading up on you that you studied chemical engineering in school. Where did that interest in engineering come from? Yeah, I studied chemical engineering and I really um, kind of attribute that to obviously my childhood growing up. Um, I, I, I will be remiss if I don't acknowledge my parents. Both of my parents are engineers. Um, oh, really? my father, okay. Yeah, my father's electrical engineer and my mother was an environmental engineer. So I definitely grew up with a lot of engineering influences um, around me, not only my parents, but also aunts and uncles um, who are in engineering or some STEM related field. Yeah. So I have a very strong kind of STEM background. Oh, yeah, nice. It's a family business. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, if you wanted to, if you had wanted to, so if you went to your parents, so your father's electrical, your mother's environmental, and you would said to them, you know what, I want to become an actor or something like that. Would that have gone over well? Uh, no, I think my <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's, and this what's interesting is that my major was chemical engineering, but my minor is theater. So really? actually, it wasn't too far fetched. I've actually <laughs> I actually did have an interest in some somewhat in acting. So that's <laughs> not that wasn't too far fetched for me. Um, but yeah, I think that they supported really anything that I or my siblings, I have three siblings, um, were, you know, were interested in. And so that includes, um, you know, it, really whatever. So of the four of us, three of us are, are did pursue a STEM career, but my, I have one sister who did not. And so they, they still love her. <laughs> okay, so you guys actually the black sheep. <laughs> well, I guess y'all are black, so I guess y'all are black sheep, right? <laughs> that's great. Well, that's, that's pretty interesting. I, I don't think I... I don't know anybody who both of their parents were engineers. So well, that's, that's pretty cool. But yeah, both my parents went to Georgia Tech. That's actually how they met. Oh, okay. and so they met in college and um, again, both engineering backgrounds. My mother is from Los Angeles. So she left Los Angeles to go to Georgia Tech. And my father's from the Atlanta area and he went to Georgia Tech. So they met, you know, um, being engineering students together. Oh, wow. Well, that's pretty cool. I'm, I was just thinking, so you said you had a minor in theater, so I'm guessing if you decide to flip it and say, you know, I want to major in theater instead and have my minor in engineering, you know, would that, would that have been all right? But from, at least when you say, you say your parents were happy with their, whatever you were doing, so maybe it would have went over okay? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that they were more interested in us being happy and choosing careers and we would, you know, that, that kind of allowed us to utilize our strengths. Yeah. Um, and, all, and they also probably wanted us to choose careers that, you know, of course, we could find good jobs and all of that sort of thing. So um, I think I would like to think they would have been happy at whatever we decided to choose. Um, <laughs> I, 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 can, I, can, I can definitely say for a fact that they were um, ecstatic that we end up choosing, um, you know, I end up choosing chemical engineering in, in general. Yeah, because that's the kind of degree that you can use almost in any in industry and so it has a lot of versatility and they were definitely happy with that decision yeah for sure so um, i guess you kind of answered this question but is the, the i guess the main reason you chose chemical engineering was because of the versatility well no no, no. i chose it because i love math and chemistry okay so in, in high school um i gravitated towards chemistry a lot and so when i took chemistry as a sophomore in high school i just really did enjoy um the things i was learning and then combined with math math is a subject i've always loved i think since you know elementary school i always enjoyed math 
And then when chemistry came along in high school, I was like, wow, I really like chemistry too. So to me, the merging of the two was chemical engineering. Oh, okay. All right. That, that, that makes sense. I'm, okay. So out of curiosity, well, we'll, we'll see, we'll see what, 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 what happens. So when you were in school, in high school, and you had these, this interest in math and chemistry, and you're thinking chemical engineering when you go into to, to university or college, did you have teachers that were encouraging of it? Or did you have, or, 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 and if not, did you have teachers that were kind of like, eh, are you sure you want to do that? You know, I didn't, I don't remember specifically having this conversation with teachers. I think because my parents are both engineers, I didn't really seek out that advice from my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> Unsolicited advice. What's that? Unsolicited advice. Yeah, no, no, nothing unsolicited. Okay. I was um, one of the top students in my high school. Okay. I had amazing teachers who were great at teaching, you know, math and science and other subjects. So, it, I mean, they were, my teachers were amazing. So okay. they really would support me in anything I would have decided to do. Um, I remember when I was applying to different schools, I think I was the only student in my high school ever to, to go to MIT. <laughs> And for undergraduate college. So when they, when I was, um, you know, when I was applying for colleges and needing recommendations and all of that sort of thing, they were, you know, eager to help me um, get into MIT and get into the other schools I was applying to. So no, they were extremely supportive. I, again, I can't remember having the conversation specifically about engineering so much, but definitely about colleges and, and getting recommendation letters and, you know, any, anything I needed from teachers. I, I really did have some awesome teachers I could rely on. Okay, that well, that's that's great to hear because I've heard some, and even myself included, some horror stories about guidance counselors and and teachers in in the high school sometimes discouraging you know people that look like us from going into into those fields. So I'm glad, like, well, I guess also the fact that you had two parents that were engineers and you were already and you were doing really well. There's nothing anyone at the school could tell you to, to say that, that you shouldn't go into it anyway. So, I mean, you had that going for you. Right. And, and again, just in general, the, the school that I went to and the fact that I was one of the top students in my class, it, you know, it was definitely more, um, you can do anything you put your mind to. You can go anywhere. You can do anything. That was the mentality that, you know, that was kind of the culture that I experienced in my high school. Excellent. So once you finished college, I guess, you, you did you go on to start working as an engineer right away? So throughout my four years of, in undergraduate school, I um, did work every summer. Um, so I had different internship opportunities. So my first experience was working in manufacturing at a manufacturing plant that, um, that produced polymers. So that was, um, that was definitely a lot of hands-on experience working as a, a process engineer. Um, I did that actually for two summers, and then the third summer I worked in a laboratory for um, for a company called it was called Amoco at the time. But then BP, the oil and gas company BP, bought the company Amoco, so it became BP. And then my fourth summer I interned at BP again. This time it was officially BP because now Amoco again was. Um, didn't exist at that point any longer and i got a chance to move to london for that last internship opportunity and work at their british headquarters um, again as a chemical engineer and then i went straight to graduate school so after completing my um, time at bp in london um, for roughly three or four months or so i moved to california and went to graduate school at uc berkeley so um so lots of kind of work experience through internships and then that led me to graduate school. Oh, okay. So, so, then, so what happened after graduate school? So um, throughout graduate school, I worked for the United States Department of Agriculture okay. as a chemical engineer, um, doing more lab-based work, um, working really as a, as like a metabolic engineer or a, um, really a science action a science capacity a lot of more like a scientist because a lot of what i was doing there was novel and had never been done before so i was able to publish papers and and really present a lot to the scientific community about the research we were doing at the usda um i also joined a program at 
in graduate school at UC Berkeley with, um, that was a combination of the engineering school and the business school. So there was this program called Management of Technology, MLT for short. And the MLT program was intriguing to me because it allowed you to combine, um, to, to join classes with, with business students. Um, and so that was, that was something that I never really, um, had never taken a class in business before, but thought it was important to kind of learn the business side of things, kind of learn that language and just have some kind of exposure to that. So, and, and with my father's encouragement too, I decided to do that program. So it was a certificate program. You take a certain number of courses, but as I was doing that program, I got really interested in the MBA program. And um, I was like, huh, like this will be really interesting about the really combine engineering with business and be able to add value to a corporation and be able to speak both languages. So um, after that program, I actually went to, back to school again, and this time for MBA. So that, that uh, I left California, actually went to New York for a while to work, and then I found myself in Atlanta, back in Atlanta, because I'm from here, but back here to pursue an MBA at Emory University. And it was after pursuing that MBA that I then become, became an entrepreneur, which again, at the time I wasn't, I didn't know if I was going to go into the program to pursue entrepreneurship, but it was during the program that I decided to kind of follow that path. And um, I've been an entrepreneur for 10 years now um, in the STEM education space with the mission to um, strengthen this, the foundation of students with ma of math and science and give, make them, help them become more STEM fluent, help them with, to think critically and logically, as well as to help close the gender gap in STEM. So I have a lot of sort of, I have a huge passion around STEM fluency, having a strong foundation in math and science. That's really the mission of Math SP that you mentioned. And then the mission of STEM Gems is all around giving girls role models and helping them to see themselves in science, technology, engineering, and math careers. Wow, that's a, that's a lot of school, uh, you know, like undergrad, then grad school, then MBA. Out of curiosity, so did you do, uh, when you were in grad school, did you do a master's or a PhD? So that's an interesting, that's a good question. And so I was actually in a PhD program. Um, I did three years and then I, wrote a master's thesis and did not complete the last two years of the PhD. So I end up um, deciding to, I think that MLT program really <laughs> um, excited me so much that I wanted, I really wanted to do the MBA. And so I decided uh, at that point in time, I was thinking about, again, long-term, what my long-term plans were, and they kind of had changed a little bit. And it was, I saw myself more using that degree combined with my engineering degree than the PhD. So I had to make that tough decision at that point in time, whether to continue the program or, um, or, you know, do something else. And so, you know, after many, many conversations and a lot of um, self discovery and things like that, I did decide on a master's degree. Um, so again, three years in to a PhD, then deciding just to get the master's, just to write the thesis and get a master's and then go to pursue an MBA. Well, you know, you and I have that in, in common. I was also in, in a PhD program, but I, I wasn't there for three years though. <laughs> I realized after a year that, you know, I, I don't know if I want to be here, you know, four or five, because you know, with PhD, you don't know how long they're going to take. They take as, as long as, you know, your, your advisor and, and committee think that you should be there to do the work. I mean, but you said you had two more years to go. You, you think it really would have been two more years? That's what you yeah, were told? Yeah, I mean, by year three, I had already started publishing and getting great results. And um, yeah, I don't think I would have been there past five years. Um, five years was pretty standard for my program. Not many people took longer than that. Um, so I don't, I didn't see any, you know, I, I didn't have any pause about sort of the process taking too long in that sense. I came in thinking five years and that was pretty much what the stand what the standard is there yeah okay well that that's good to know because you know it, it, that really does kind of vary from from school to school one of the two schools I went to it was four years like four years after four years they're pretty good at getting people out 
and, and, and into, into doing stuff, either postdocs or industry or whatever they want to do. But at some schools, it just seems like, my God, you're still here? Like, <laughs> I was like, I was a freshman when I started this. Well, that's a here. great question to, to <laughs> ask before you even, you know, go to a graduate program is, is, is kind of find out what the average tenure is of a PhD student. And, you know, those important questions even, you know, while you're deciding which school to go to. Yeah, definitely. So you finished, so then you, you, you finish your, your, your graduate program, you do an MBA, I guess MBA takes what, two years? Yes. Okay, so you finish that, but then you decide, I'm not gonna be an employee, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. So what, right. really, what really motivated that decision of, I guess, foregoing employeedom and then becoming an, an, an entrepreneur? Well, I think it was the, so in between a two year MBA program, you have a summer, internship and I think it was really that particular internship that um, so sold me on the idea that I really did not necessarily want to do a larger company um, I, I saw a lot of people in the organization that had been there for 20 plus years and I really felt like they were at a level that I could be at that I would like to have been at in a much shorter period of time. <laughs> okay. so, you know, it's harder to climb the ranks, so to speak, right. with a larger yeah. organization. And I felt like I didn't want to have to spend 20 years at an organization to get to that sort of level. Mm -hmm. So when I got back to campus after that summer internship and I went into my second year of, of the MBA program, I um, really started to think about some other options and looked at some smaller companies, more startup type companies. And I also thought about, like I said, entrepreneurship. And as I spoke with classmates and peers and professors and family and friends and kind of thought through it a little bit more and just kind of sat down with career coaches and really felt, felt um, had a clear picture of sort of my interests and my talents and my skill sets and that sort of thing, it just that's where I landed on, on starting my own business and really with the goals I had in mind and the passion that I had for achieving those goals, it just felt like the right thing to do. And here I am 10 years later and still very much passionate about the work that I do and, and seeing the difference that I'm making and, and really, you know, excited about the possibilities that I have to um, affect the next generation and really be an influence to um to them yeah you know you're a lot more you seem to be a lot more put together than i was when i was coming out of graduate school like i even though the fact that you had the wherewithal to go to career coaches i i don't even think i knew what a career coach was at the time all i knew was i i was broke and i needed a job i i was tired i was tired of not having buddy and i just i remember just sending out a whole bunch of resumes and then eventually i got i got a job but you know, and I worked for a number of years in, in product development as an engineer. But the fact that you knew coming out of school that entrepreneurship was even something that you could, that was even possible to do. I, I, I tip my hat off to you. Well, you know, and that's a testament to the university to, and I will, you know, Emory University was what a business school is where I went. And so that is a testament to, you know, the staff there, the career center there, the professors, like the, the, the culture of the school is how it's able to really find that, that I did honestly feel, see myself as an entrepreneur. It was, the, it was a culture of the school. And then having the support of the um, different staff members in the career center that, you know, actively wanted to help students to figure out their next step. So, you know, it was a lot of utilizing the resources that I had through the school um, that allowed me to figure out sort of what that next step for, for me was. Okay. Well, again, I, I tip my hat off to you. That even, I mean, yeah, the, the school may be giving you a push, but the people people can push, but if you're not willing to take the push, <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't really mean all that much. So yeah. the fact that you were confident enough, even at that age, to, to start your own business, that's, that's highly commendable. There's people, I'm sure, twice your age that work for somebody. They're, they're the same people that work at a company 20 years and be happy that they made it to, I don't know, director level and they'll, and they'll retire as, as a director, not, never seeing any kind of increase past that. So again, that's, 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 that's really cool. So, you know, I mentioned math SP in the, in the, in the intro, 
So what exactly does MAPSP do? So are you basically, do you help, like, do you, t do you provide tutors to the students in, in math and science? So what does it look yeah, like? Yeah, so instead of the word tutor, we use the word coach, um, okay. academic coach. So it's similar concept, but an academic coach is a little bit more encompassing than just a tutor. So we really do help students, again, with the, with the content that they're working on. So we will certainly help them with the math and the science and the different concepts they're working on in the classroom. But we're gonna also help them become independent thinkers and critical thinkers and sufficient learners. So it's really about create, helping them to create a skill set that they can use not just for that particular class and to pass that one test, but something they can use for a lifetime. So the earlier they develop these critical thinking skills, the better they're going to be able to apply those skills to um, to their courses and their life. So um, yes, yeah, so we work with students starting in middle school, and um, we parents call us and they request an academic coach for their child, um, and we match the students with one of our academic coaches. All of our coaches are STEM professionals, so that's like really important that we um, are hiring people that have strong STEM backgrounds and are able to um, not just, again, teach you about just, you know, for a test per se, but help you to see that really STEM is all around us. And if you look all around you, you know, the table, you're, you're sitting at the chair, the bed, I mean, everything that you touch every day is STEM. And so our coaches really help students to kind of help make it, make concepts come alive more. Um, also help them with study skills and just be, a, be overall better students. So, um, we work with again, middle school, high school, and college students. And then we also had do test prep coaching in addition to academic coaching. And test prep coaching is really helping students achieve their goals. Um, and a lot of them have goals to go into college. And part of the application process is taking these standardized exams. And so there's a lot of strategy to taking these exams, a lot of problem solving, a lot of critical thinking. So again, we also help our, our students master the concepts and the strategies and the problem solving they need to do well on those types of exams. So math SP is really about those two things, the STEM academic coaching and the test prep coaching. Okay, and for the, the academic coaches for math SP, I know you mentioned that you're in the Atlanta area. Are all the coaches, I guess, do they work I guess, one on one in person with, with students or is any of it done virtually? Yeah. Um, well, our business model is really focused on the, the state of Georgia because there's just a lot of opportunity right here in our state. Georgia is, is not one of the highest performing states, so we just are really focused on um, our community here. And so we do, um, we have lots of sort of strategies of tackling this. A lot of it is one-on-one. -on -one. Obviously, you get the best, um, the best outcomes when you can really help a student out on a one-on-one -on -one personal basis but we do also have other offerings that are more um, small groups or large groups typically we partner with organizations um, that can utilize our services and offer um, a, a group type of scenario so there, there's there's um customized things that we do for certain organizations or schools or community partners etc but on a um on a whole we do partner more with the parents and the families and work with the students on an individual basis. That's probably maybe 60 to 70 percent of our model and the other percentage is is um, working in groups and small both small groups and large groups more community-based type of approach. Okay cool so I mean I also mentioned in the in the intro what I, what I really really wanted to talk about I mean, every, all this other stuff is all cool and all, but this STEM Gems book, I think is just, well, first of all, the name is really good. I hope you trademark it. So, <laughs> the, the, so there's that. And so uh, I really like the name. So, and then the, the fact that you were able to bring all these women together that from different, various STEM fields to just maybe talk about or to just expose girls to, to the various STEM fields that maybe they didn't even know about. Where, do you, where did the idea of STEM Gems even come from? Yeah, so that just really came from my background um, growing up. I knew about, a, I, I did know about STEM careers, obviously, because of my parents. Right. But there were still so many careers that I did not know about. So I knew about what, I knew what they did. And I knew maybe probably more than the average teen person, you know, teen knew, my average peer knew at the time. But there were still so many things, obviously, I had no clue existed. And that so many 
teens and, and preteens have no clue about a lot of these careers. And so if you ask a preteen or a teen to name a career in, you know, in STEM, like, I mean, I ask them all the time and they can maybe name one or two, but they really have no clue. Um, and so maybe they know what it, they've heard engineer, they, they've heard the term before, but they don't really know the different types of engineering. They don't really know that there's so many options. They can't tell me what these engineers actually do. Um, they don't know how they make a difference in the world. They don't really know how they help people. So it's not the kind of career that you're gonna learn about by watching a television show because there's not, there's, don't, there's not anything on television these days that speaks to the life of an engineer or the life of a scientist or you know, a STEM person, um, especially a woman. And so I really, feel that um, because of the lack of attention given to careers in STEM, it was important to, um, to highlight some of these careers that, again, without this book, you probably have never heard of, and not just kids, but adults too. A lot of adults have never heard of these careers either. Um, mm -hmm. So it was a great way for me to highlight careers in STEM, a diversity of careers, 44 of them, as well as women and show the world, you know, especially you know, the youth, that these are careers that are not just um, for, for men. And they, they are certainly male dominated careers. Um, that is certainly true, but they are not, they are definitely open and they're definitely possibilities that girls can pursue as well. So by featuring the careers and also featuring a, a woman in that career, it really helps girls to see themselves in some of these non-traditional careers, um, male-dominated careers, and gives them role models. And I think that in order to aspire to be something in life, you have to have a role model. You have to have the inspiration to, to, to become that. And without that inspiration, it's never going to be even on your radar. So the earlier we can get to these this, these kids and expose them to these careers and expose them to role models, the more likely they're going to latch on to that and start to see themselves in some of these careers that, again, may have otherwise not even been an option for them. Yeah, I, I, I firmly agree with what you're talking about. So the book STEM Gems, is it, what age range of girls would it, is, is your target? So it's really for, I would say, as early as, um, there is no, they really, I don't like to put a too much of a, a bucket around a bracket around it because I have a five-year-old daughter and we read the book together. So, and she's in kindergarten. So, I mean, can she read it on her own? No, she, she's learning how to read now. So she cannot read it for herself, but I can certainly read it to her. So I feel like a parent could pick up the book and read it to their child as early as, you know, there is no, you know, there really is no early age as early as you want. Um, and then, but I think for, for most self-readers, I would probably say the more appropriate age for someone to read it on their own was around fourth grade, is when you can pick up the book for yourself and read it for yourself and understand it. So the sweet spot, I would say, is really fifth grade to, you know, to high school is a sweet spot of when it's more critical that girls start reading this book. It's critical starting in fifth grade that they have this book and that they um you know take the time to read about the women read about the careers and they do that all throughout their middle school years and even into their high school years that's the sweet spot but i certainly feel like it's appropriate for a parent to read it with their child and for even an adult to read it maybe adult who's already in her career i think there's a lot of inspiration for um for working professionals as well as you know younger um you know, younger girls and, and young women as well. So it, it, it's, it just depends on the individual. Yeah. Okay. Well, to, to those that are, that are listening, if you're looking for some bedtime reading for your kids, throw away green eggs and ham and pick up stem gems, right? <laughs> well, you can keep green eggs and ham, you know, that's <laughs> but definitely add stem gems to your, your home library for sure. No doubt. So I'm, I'm actually kind of curious as to the, I guess, the, the selection, or, or I guess, which came first, the, the, the careers that you wanted to, to have in the book or, or the women? So did you find the women and you wanted them to have, you know, various careers, or did you have certain careers in mind and then you found the women to meet those careers? Great question. The careers definitely came first because the, the primary goal initially was there's so many awesome careers out there that people don't know about. 
and brainstorming the careers first, like careers that I wish I had known about when I was, like I said, a preteen. And, you know, obviously some that I did know about, but a lot of the ones that I didn't know about, as well as, um, you know, careers that most people don't really think about. It, it, these are not things that you're going to, again, see on television, see in the media, see really anywhere. So unless you have a, a, a family member or a neighbor or someone in your, in your community who is in one of these careers, you may, you may go your whole life without even knowing that this is something that even exists. So it's, it was definitely a, a, a brainstorm of careers first. And then once I had the careers, then it was like, okay, let me do some research and find a woman who is really doing phenomenal work in this career, in these careers. And that just was a lot of, a lot of research, online research to figure out um, who, who in this, who represents this career, you know, the best. Cause I didn't want to have, you know, five women in just in one field. I wanted to have one per field. And so even though a lot of these careers are overlapping, um, a lot of the women have some, you know, may have a background, let's say in computer science, but using that degree in a different field per se. So there's a lot of great area in these STEM area, you know, in, within the STEM acronym, there's a lot of overlap. But I did want to find a woman who represents that particular field and um, has a great story about how she got there as well as the work she's done in that career, her challenges, her successes, her advice, um, you know, just really telling her story of what, what made her choose that career. And then now that she's there, you know, how she's makes a difference in the world and, and things that she had, has had to um, kind of hurdle, she's had to overcome to really get to that point. Yeah, definitely. Out of curiosity, are there plans to release, I guess, uh, I guess future editions of the book with, with different careers? Yeah, that's a great question. So I've actually started adding on different careers to um, the STEM Gems blog. So there's 40 for careers in the book, but if you go on the website and look at the blog, you'll, you'll read about other careers that are not featured in the book. Um, so I'm always adding on new women, new careers um, via the STEM Gems website. Um, so definitely check that out because that is a place where you'll learn about the 44 kind of original STEM gems, the, the ambassadors of this whole mission. But then there's new women all the time kind of at sharing their story, adding on. Um, and so I just try to keep that updated through the, the blog and through um, the website, um, you know, and other types of things that I've been launching. So I think that's a good place to go to kind of learn more about not just the 44, but some additional ones as well. All right, excellent. All right, I'm going to definitely check that out. So the fact that you're an author, I'm, I'm assuming, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming that you're asked to go and speak about the book in various places. So if you weren't a very effective public speaker at first, you, you ha you've kind of had to become one. If, yes. If, so out of curiosity, have you always been, if public speaking always been a strong suit of yours? And if not, what have you done to get better at it? That's a great question. Yeah, I, I do a lot of public speaking now, definitely more than ever. I think that any author, especially with a mission and a platform, is, is one of your goals to be able to get your mission out into the world. And you do that through public speaking. So um, I've had to, at this point, I've been doing it for nearly four to five years. So it's been a while. But I mean, when I first started speaking, um, I think the key thing was making sure I had my message, you know, the, making sure the message was clear, making sure the delivery was clear. So when I, you know, I can't recall my very first public speaking that, that was engaging STEM gems because I mean, prior to STEM gems, I had done some, a little bit of speaking before, just probably in school in settings or in work environments, you know, something on that nature, not necessarily to a, you know, group of hundreds of people, um, or even thousands of people like I've done, you know, with STEM gyms. But um, again, I think if you have a clear message and you are able to support that message with data and research and, um, and because this book was a ton of research, I mean, you know, interviewing all the women and, and researching careers and researching, you know, data in those careers, it was a lot of research. So, but that by, by itself, you know, was enough for me to, more than enough for me to put together a presentation and kind of talk through 
um, so, so much of this. There's so much information I could share. The, the key thing is what to share for which audience. So there's different audiences. And so you have to think about, you know, what is more relevant for this audience versus the next audience. Um, when I'm talking to a group of teachers, for example, that's a different conversation than talking with a group of parents or talking with a group of STEM women professionals or STEM women and men professionals or kids. So it's like for each audience, you have to tailor your presentation a different way. So um, and in terms of public speaking, the ability to speak in front of people, I think that um, the more you do it, the better you get at it. So um, again, in the beginning, I was probably a lot more nervous than I am now. And now I don't really have many nerves at all. Like I can get on the stage and talk to, you know, one person or 5,000 people at ease. Um, but it wasn't always that way. And um, I think, but I do believe that the confidence you have in public speaking comes with your message. So if you have a very clear message, like a very compelling message, and um, then that, that allows you to you may have those initial fears of like oh my gosh there's so many people in the audience but when you start speaking and recognizing that they are here they're there to hear your message and you have something to say that's important then you kind of get over the part the part that there's all these people listening to you and you really get into the message part of it and as long as you know what you're talking about and the message is clear you know the nerves dissipate and um you know, and then once you've done one or two or three, then it, then it definitely becomes easier, you know, any the additional time. So, um, so yeah, it has been definitely a hurdle, but now that it's, you know, it's, I can, I can't count anymore how many times I've done public speaking. So it's, it's definitely more at ease for me now. Now with every new audience comes, you know, probably a little bit of, okay, okay how do I tailor this presentation for this audience? How do I make sure that it's appropriate? So that's, still happening to this day because there's always variations of audience members but um but the content is i think i'm very confident in that part of it which allows me to be confident overall yeah that's that's that's, that's really great to hear are there besides having a, a compelling message are there other tips that you would offer people in becoming a better public speaker yeah i think one of the other key things is is really telling your story it is like you're telling your story and making sure that um your that your story has a beginning a middle and an end right so um i will i did actually sit down with a storyteller um she is actually a playwright so it's interesting because there's all these speaking coaches and etc and, and and they are i'm sure really great at helping you tell a story but I sat down with a playwright, someone who writes plays for a living. And obviously when you write plays, you're telling stories. And so sitting down with her and going through a presentation, and this was probably um, one of my largest presentations that I had up until that point. I think it was about 1,500 people. So I wanted to be sure I was ready for 1,500 people because that's different from just talking to 100 or 200 people. So for that size audience, I felt the need to sit down with a professional storyteller and make sure that I can properly properly entertain an audience of that size for you know 45 minutes right. so um so 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 she went slide by slide with me and had me kind of share my story and I think that that was hugely helpful because um instead of me sort of um doing things the way I had maybe done in the past prior to that particular presentation um she really helped it to come more alive and i added in addi some additional slides and took out some slides and really just changed you know not changed the overall content but really changed how i presented that content mm -hmm. so i think you know thinking about your presentation as a story that has a clear beginning you know the middle and the end, especially the beginning and the ending because that's what people remember the most is the first thing you say and the last thing you say yep. and it, you know she she helped me to understand that the start and the finish are are really super important and making sure you go out there and the first thing you say out of your mouth should be very powerful and then the last thing you say that you kind of leave them with should also be very powerful they may forget stuff in the middle but definitely those two things um i thought more about after having you know sat down with that particular coach and um and when i went into that presentation probably a week or two later 
delivered what I thought was a well, um, well executed presentation. And I made sure that I took all her advice. So um, that would be the other key piece I would say is just to make sure that the presentation flows and that it, it is a story and that you have a powerful opening and a powerful closing that are memorable. And, um, and then everything in the middle, you know, of course is, is important as well, but just, um, you know, how you start and how you finish are critical. I firmly agree with what you're saying, Stephanie, because no one likes a rambler. <laughs> you know, you kind of want to see, just what you were saying, you want, you want there to be some sort of natural logical flow to the story, because you don't want to go all over the place, because then people will stop listening, and then they'll start checking their phones, or if you're like me, start staring into space and thinking about what you want to eat for lunch. That kind of thing. <laughs> and that's why telling the story helps, right? Yeah. It's like every slide you tell has to connect with what you previously shared and has to have a progression of ideas. Um, so, you know, it's sitting down and thinking through all of that and, and then even practicing with, you know, having a few audience members to practice with is, is also very helpful. For sure. Is there anything else that you'd, you'd like to say that, uh, that I haven't asked or, that, or you want to, uh, people to know about what you're doing? Um, well, one thing that we didn't talk about were, we talked about the STEM gyms book, but not the clubs themselves. And I think that's a really important thing to know. You know what? I had it on my list. The only reason I didn't do it is because you said, I, I told, I, when you'd asked how long this is going to take, you said, I said 30 minutes. And we've already gone over 30 minutes. Oh, oh so, gosh. That's why I didn't, that's why I didn't ask it. I didn't want to get off of there. And then you'd say, you know what, you only told me this is going to take 30 minutes and you were asking a whole bunch of questions. But uh, yeah, I definitely had step, uh, the STEM clubs on, on the list. So I, I'd love to hear about the STEM club. What, yeah, what exactly are they? So the STEM Jones clubs um, is really a way to engage with the book and, and then really have a deeper conversation with a group of girls and a group of women um, and to help the book really come alive. So you can pick up this book and you can take it home and you can read it on your own. You can have it, you know, you can read it with your parent or you can just, you know, flip through it and read it every night or what have you. But I think when you get into a community of um, girls and boys too, boys are certainly welcome in the clubs, but primarily girls getting together, picking one of the careers, picking one of the women, reading her story, talking about it, having conversation and dialogue. Um, there, are, there are structured discussion guides on the STEM Gems website. And so what happens is that schools or Girl Scout troops or um, community groups, YWCA, you know, whoever, wherever the club is, um, the, the club leader, the ambassador of the club can download the discussion guide from the STEM Gems website and use that as a conversation um, starter for the club members. So I, 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 it's been, there's about, I think roughly 40 clubs now that are spread across the country. And um, I get such positive um, feedback from the clubs just about how the clubs are impacting the girls, how having the discussions around the women and the careers and the women's advice and guidance and action items really, um, really does help girls to, again, visualize themselves in that career and understand the steps it takes to get to that, you know, to get to, into that career. Um, so I, so having the book and, and reading it on your own or with your parent is great, but I really feel like being a part of a club where you are around your peers and you can, you can really um, dive deeper into the content of the book and then have different activities that are associated with the particular career is a great way to um, have, a, have a more of a lasting impact and really have a really change lives through the clubs. Are the clubs for for middle school or high school or both? So there's clubs as early as fourth grade. So again, there's there's clubs in elementary schools, usually fourth and fifth grade students. There's definitely clubs in middle school. There's definitely clubs in high school. There's even some clubs that have started in colleges as well. Wow, really? You know, when I see, um, when people register their club and I see the age range of the, of the members of the club, is, it's definitely a wide range. Um, but again, the sweet spot, I would say, is, is the fifth graders all the way up to the high schoolers is really where it's targeted. Um, but all the resources you need to start a club, um, the information about how to start a club and, and the discussion guides and the videos and things like that are on the STEM Gems website, which is stemgemsbook.com. And so I encourage anyone watching who's interested in starting a club 
to um, to go to that website, click on the club tab, and there you'll find out more information about how to get how to click, how to get a club started. Um, and then the other thing I'll add on before we wrap up is all is the Give Girls Role Models campaign, which you can also learn about on the stemgemsbook.com website. And that campaign is is something I just launched maybe a month ago now, and it really aims to support diversity and inclusion initiatives at STEM organizations, um, which honestly, every organization these days, every company these days has to have has STEM involvement because, you know, we are living in this world where it's hard to run any organization without technology. And so this is an opportunity for companies to acknowledge the diversity and inclusion initiatives, um, to, to acknowledge and, and really increase visibility amongst women in STEM in their organization to help women feel more empowered, to help women feel more connected to the work that they're doing, and also to help them reach back and, 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 and really help the next generation um, to be a role model to that middle school or high school girl that's in the local school, um, you know, in their community. It's really a chance for women to really get involved with their community and, and be visible. So it's a visibility campaign. And again, there's more information about the campaign and how to become a partner organization on the stemgemsbook.com website. Wow, this, you know, Stephanie, this has been, this has been an education. I'm so glad we were able to, to talk. I know we went over half an hour. Hopefully you're not too mad at me for that. <laughs> but, um, all right, cool. So yeah, that, that basically marks the, marks the end. I mean, how can people get in touch with you? Yeah, I think the best way to get in touch with me is through the website, stemgemsbook.com. You can also find me on social media. You can find me on LinkedIn at Stephanie Espy. You can find me on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook at, um, at stemgemsbook. Stem, gem, plural gem. Um, so social media or via website is the best way to reach me. Um, definitely website because it has really all the different offerings and programs and press and um just different things that we're doing that's where we, we kind of everything lives on that website so check it out excellent well everybody uh, thanks for for tuning in this is uh, my name is neil thompson the founder of teach the geek it's an online platform for science and engineering professionals the first offering is my public speaking course called teach the geek to speak to learn more about it you can go to teachthegeek.com again that's teachthegeek.com until next time please take care <laughs>